Jack Lee Stokowski, and this is a short presentation on the history of modern geometry. Our presentation begins with a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. Modern geometry is a large topic, so mostly we'll focus on the individuals who contributed and the major branches of geometry which have arisen through the ages. First, any history of geometry must begin with the survey of the geometers and the mathematicians who lived in ancient Greece. And then from then, we'll fast forward into the 17th century, where we'll discuss the foundations of analytic geometry and projective geometry. Following that, we'll be discussing developments in the 18th century, where people explored the geometry of Euclid in depth and developed something called neutral geometry. Afterwards, the establishment of truly non-Euclidean geometries, specifically hyperbolic geometry and spherical geometry, that happened around the 19th century. And finally, we'll end with a survey of some very recent developments in geometry called fractal geometry. First, any history of geometry, or indeed mathematics, should begin with Thales. Born somewhere around 624 BC, he's the earliest Greek mathematician known, and in fact, uh, philosophers such as Aristotle or Russell credit him with actually being the first philosopher. He was one of the first people to use deductive reasoning, and therefore he's really hailed as the first true mathematician. He's credited with things such as using shadows to measure the height of the pyramids in Egypt, using arguments that involved similar triangles, or the angle-side-angle -angle congruence theorem, to measure the distance to ships at sea, and he also advocated the use of general arguments to explain things in geometry, rather than measurement in special cases. Some of the arguments he's credited with include proving that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal, or the vertical angles made by two intersecting lines, those are equal. After Thales, we have Pythagoras, whose name is famously attached to the Pythagorean theorem, which relates the lengths of the sides of a right triangle. But a lot of stories about Pythagoras are actually somewhat unreliable. He was born on the island of Samos, we know that, and many sources say that he spent time traveling in Egypt, where it's possible he may have met the mathematician Thales. And then, approximately 530 BC, he moved to Croton, which is a Greek colony in southern Italy, and he set up a religious order, a philosophical school, which was shrouded in secrecy. And this is why a lot of stories about Pythagoras are somewhat unreliable. They believe that the Pythagoreans, which is the brotherhood that he set up, they thought that mathematics lied behind all things. They believed that number is everything, and the properties of number related to properties of the universe around us. Following Pythagoras, I'd love to mention Plato here, he's a classical philosopher and a student of the great Socrates, and he founded the Academy in Athens, famously inscribed above the entranceway to Plato's Academy was the following phrase in Greek, Medeus Ageometetros Isito Montensegen, which roughly translates into "Let no one ignorant of geometry enter here." Plato greatly valued the use of deductive reasoning and logical argument. Somewhat after Plato is Euclid, born in probably approximately 325 BC. He's very possibly, but we're not sure if he's one of Plato's students. What he's really famous for is a book he wrote called The Elements, The Elements of Geometry, in which he summarized a lot of results that were known, but he presented them in an idealized axiomatic form. The idea was to lay down or a series of axioms and definitions and to use the rules of logic to deduce subsequent theorems. We know that Euclid was not the person who proved a lot of these, but because of his organization and categorizing of these results, he's earned a place eternally in the history of mathematics. After Euclid, Archimedes was also quite famous. He's generally considered one of the greatest mathematicians of time. He did work in geometry as well as other areas. He's credited with approximating the value of pi by using a numerical method of iteration, 
He's also credited with being able to sum an infinite series. And he used the method of exhaustion, again, this idea of approximations, which approach the true value, in this case, approximating the area underneath a parabola. And an approximate contemporary of Archimedes was Apollonius of Perga. He was a Greek geometer and astronomer, and in particular, he's famous for his work on the conic sections. His work influenced a lot of names, including Kepler and Newton and Descartes. It was actually Apollonius who gave names to the ellipse, the parabola, and the hyperbola, three examples of conic sections. Now, after these famous Greek mathematicians, we have an interesting gap in the history of mathematics. The nation of Greece was conquered by the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire itself fell later on. A lot of the knowledge we have from Greek mathematics was preserved by Arabic scholars. A lot of the classical texts were translated or stored. The mathematical tradition is carried on by various individuals throughout history. There's a lot of investigation into the earlier mathematics, the mathematics of the ancients, the greats, and attempts to further what they've done. That actually brings us back to our history of modern geometry. And that brings us back to our story, the history of modern geometry. One of the first new and important directions that geometry took was the creation of analytic geometry. It was discovered and created at roughly the same time by two different individuals, René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat. And they introduced this idea of analytic geometry, the geometry which involves coordinate systems, assigning pairs of numbers to give the position of points in the plane, and the use of equations into geometry. And this was very important, not only for its own sake, but this was an important precursor to the development of the calculus. Another important development we have is the development of projective geometry by Gerard Desargues. This geometry is particularly important in perspective drawing. When you draw a geometric figure in perspective, certain properties are preserved no matter what angle you view it at, but other properties are not. For instance, as a geometric figure moves around in space, certain properties, like the incidence of points, may be preserved, the intersections of lines, but as we look at things from different perspectives, it might appear as though the measure of an angle changes. So, what types of properties are consistent in this geometry? What kinds of theorems or results can we prove? Shortly after these two branches of geometry were introduced, other developments in mathematics were introduced, such as the development of calculus by Newton and Leibniz. Now, while these two individuals aren't really thought of as geometers, the techniques of the calculus can be applied to geometry to further investigate some questions, such as slopes of tangent lines to curves or areas underneath curves. After the development of the calculus, other individuals investigated the origins of geometry, in particular the axioms that Euclid had used in order to prove all the results in the elements. Now, the five axioms he started with in Book 1, the first four axioms seem self-evident, they're reasonable to assume, but the fifth axiom, which concerns the nature of parallel lines, was very verbose and complicated. Euclid, in fact, when he used these axioms, he avoided the fifth axiom as long as possible. The first 28 propositions of the elements are proved without any reference or use of this fifth axiom. So later mathematicians investigated if it was possible to prove this fifth axiom from the first four. One of the first people to do very important work in this area was Giovanni Saccheri. In his investigations, he tried to assume the fifth postulate was false and derive a contradiction. One of the figures that he used extensively in his work is now called the Saccheri quadrilateral. It's a quadrilateral which contains three right angles, and in particular, he tries to show that the fourth angle must also be a right angle. He investigated what happened when the fourth angle of this quadrilateral, when it was acute, when it was obtuse, or when it's a right angle. Now, he was able to prove that if this angle was obtuse, well, that implies the fifth postulate, or the fifth axiom, of Euclid is true, and obtains his contradiction. 
Then he investigated the case in which this fourth angle was acute, and he derived many of the theorems of what we now call non-Euclidean geometry, but he was not able to actually derive a contradiction in this case. Another individual who did work approximately the same time and investigated along the same lines was Johann Lambert. Johann was a Swiss mathematician, most famous for showing that pi was an irrational number. He also investigated these quadrilaterals of Sakari. He investigated this hypothesis that the fourth angle of a Sakari quadrilateral was acute and tried to investigate properties of this geometry. He noticed that if you assume this rule, that in this geometry, examine the angles of a triangle. As the area of such a triangle decreases, the sum of the angles of the triangle also decreases. So triangles behave differently if you don't assume the fifth axiom of Euclid. The next mathematician who's an important figure in the development of modern geometry is Legendre. Born in 1752, he's approximately a contemporary of Sakari and Lambert. Legendre spent a lot of his life working on the parallel postulate, trying to determine whether or not it follows or can be proven from the first four axioms of Euclidean geometry. He was able to prove that Euclid's fifth axiom was equivalent to the statement that the sum of the angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degrees. So he wasn't able to prove the fifth axiom, but if you're given the fact that the sum of angles of a triangle is equivalent to two right angles, then the fifth axiom follows from this fact. In fact, a lot of mathematicians, in their attempts to prove the fifth axiom of Euclid, ended up determining other statements which were logically equivalent. John Playfair, in particular, introduced one statement which is famously equivalent to Euclid's fifth axiom. His statement says that given a line in a point not on that line, there exists exactly one line through that given point parallel to the original given line. Sometimes this is called Playfair's axiom, and sometimes it's substituted in place of Euclid's fifth axiom. The next important mathematician in the history of non-Euclidean geometry was Janos Bognac. Now, his father was also a mathematician who was interested in the foundations of geometry, and his father spent uh, some fair time trying to prove Euclid's fifth axiom, the parallel postulate, and his father came up with several false proofs and advised his son to not spend any time on that problem. However, inevitably, his son did spend time on that problem, and in 1823 he even wrote a note to his father saying that, out of nothing I have created a strange new world. Bolyai wrote down his results, and it was published as a 24-page appendix to his father's book, in which he's proving a lot of results of non-Euclidean geometry. Now, this book was sent to Gauss, a famous mathematician of the time, who we'll discuss later on, and Gauss says that young geometer Bolyai is a genius of the first order. An important shift in thought was that this subject was of intrinsic use in itself. He was proving facts about a new geometry. He wasn't looking for a contradiction. His idea was, from these axioms, what can be proven? Now, at the same time, another mathematician, Nikolai Lobachevsky, was doing work in the same area in non-Euclidean geometry. And in 1829, he published this work as well. In 1840, Lobachevsky published a work called Geometrical Investigations on the Theory of Parallels. Lobachevsky replaced Euclid's fifth axiom by his own parallel postulate that there exist two lines parallel to a given line through a given point not on the line. Lobachevsky went on to investigate properties of this new geometry, including trigonometric identities for triangles which exist in this geometry. Next in our story of non-Euclidean geometry is Carl Gauss, now, Gauss had been doing work, actually before Bolyai and Lobachevsky, he had been doing work in 1817. However, Gauss didn't publish a lot of work, he did a lot of it in his head. It said that Gauss only liked to publish a work once it was in its final polished form. He read of the work of Bolyai, and while he was impressed regarding Bolyai as a genius of the first order, he also told Bolyai that he had proven similar results in a similar fashion. It was rather devastating to Bolyai, but it in no way detracts from the breakthroughs that Bolyai made in the investigation of non-Euclidean geometries. The first person to really put the work of Bolyai and Lobachevsky 
on these non-Euclidean geometries on a very secure foundation was Eugenio Beltrami. In 1868, he wrote a paper called Essay on the Interpretation of Non-Euclidean Geometry, which actually contained models for non-Euclidean geometry. Beltrami introduced models for non-Euclidean geometry, such as the Poincaré upper half plane and the Poincaré disk. Beltrami's models were named after the mathematician Poincaré, who did some work in geometry, but is really more famous for his work in topology. He wrote the Analysis Situs, which is the analysis of position, in 1895. Going back to the work of Beltrami, a lot of the work he did on his models of the non-Euclidean geometry was actually completed by Felix Klein in the year 1871. Klein was particularly interested in investigating geometry from the point of view of the transformations that are valid in that geometry, such as translations or rotations or reflections. Klein studied all these geometries from this point of view. In addition, Klein showed that there were basically three different types of geometry. There's the non-Euclidean geometries of Bolyai and Lobachevsky, where straight lines have two or more parallels. There's our standard Euclidean geometry, but there's also a spherical geometry in which there are no parallel lines, in which all lines intersect. All of this work in non-Euclidean geometry really caused people to take a close look at the axioms which Euclid used in his elements. Sometimes people even found gaps in the logical reasoning that Euclid used and proposed other axioms to fill these gaps. Probably the most famous set of axioms was proposed by David Hilbert. He introduced a set of 21 axioms which address issues such as what it means for one point to be between two other points, the continuity of lines, and so forth. And the next mathematician we're going to talk about is Georg Cantor. And he was not really a geometer, he was more of an analyst. He created some functions which had interesting properties at a certain set of points. And that set of points has interesting geometric properties itself, in particular one property called self-similarity, where if you zoom in on a certain set of these points, the result is analogous or appears similar to the original set of points. And so this is a precursor to our idea of fractal. The next mathematician in our survey of modern geometry is Hausdorff. Hausdorff enters this story because he developed a new notion of dimension. We're very used to sets of points or geometric figures that are either one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. He expanded the idea of dimensionality so we could measure the size or complexity of interesting shapes such as the Cantor set. Another interesting geometric figure was developed by von Koch. He developed something called the Koch snowflake. It's an interesting geometric figure you get, starting out with a triangle and replacing each side by a line segment of the triangular extrusion. And repeating this process, you obtain a very interesting geometric figure with infinite perimeter yet finite area. And this class of figures became known as fractals. The next two mathematicians in our historical survey are Fatou and Julia. They're a pair of mathematicians that study dynamical systems. In particular, they studied functions defined on the set of complex numbers, and they described sets of points which behaved in a certain way underneath iteration of these functions. And those sets of points had a very interesting geometric structure, but they couldn't really visualize it because of the great complexity. It fell to another mathematician, Benoit Mandelbrot, and he was a researcher at IBM, he was free to choose his own research area, and so he wrote a famous paper which studied the size of the coastline of Britain. It's a very difficult thing to measure. It depends on the scale at which you're looking or studying this coastline. He returned to the work of the earlier mathematicians. He graphed sets of points described by earlier mathematicians, such as Fatou and Julia and found that the set of points, which behaved in various ways, formed these complex sets with a self-similarity property, similar to those found in the Cantor set, or the Koch snowflake curve. He coined the term fractal to describe these, and since then, fractals have found applications in all sorts of areas of applied mathematics. These are some of the key figures in the history of modern geometry.
which is a subject which still grows every day. New developments are constantly being made, new avenues are always being explored. The story continues to unfold.